Hello and welcome to this session. I'm Nick Gowing. I'm speaking to you from London. Uh, we're going to be exploring and fostering shared humanity. It sounds a very optimistic thing to be looking at for the next 45 minutes. Um, optimism at a time when it's hard to see where there is any optimism anywhere. But there is optimism enshrined in this subject for this session. Uh, the stability, though, we take for granted is unraveling and continuing to unravel. The project I'm leading, the Thinking the Unthinkable project, saw that some time ago. It's becoming even worse. Now it's been intensified by COVID-19. And now there's the existential threat of the climate emergency. Is there even a possibility to be optimistic? Accept the imperative, the urgency, acute to address the climate emergency. That should be the argument. And re remember that we're talking about repurposing our world if we seize the moment for change. I put to you that the climate emergency is a reason to repurpose our world and seizing the moment for change. And it is a shared problem at the moment, an increasingly fractured and confrontational world that we're living in, as we're going to be hearing in a moment. As you can see, I'm joined by the president of Armenia, President Sarkisian. Uh, I'm going to be talking with him shortly. But before we get going, what I'd like to do is introduce you to the um, government of Slovenia. Why the government of Slovenia? Well, they, uh, from July, will be the rotating presidency of the 27-nation European Union. So let me introduce Janesh Kralji, a Minister for Labour, Family and Social Affairs and Equal Opportunities. my great pleasure to address you today at the Horasis Global Community Gathering. The COVID-19 pandemic ha had and still has a major impact on our way of life, economies, workplaces and workers. There are many lessons we have learned during the past year and now it is time to seize this moment for change. Building a resilient and responsive labor market is very close to my heart not only during the current crisis, but also with a look ahead to wider societal and technological changes, we need to focus much more on strengthening the responsiveness and inclusiveness of the labor markets. Ensuring the conditions for a fair and inclusive labor market in green and digital transitions will be the key for future work and consequently for shared humanity. Continuation of the discussions on mitigating the social and economic consequences of the crisis is one of the general objectives of the Slovenian Presidency to the Council of the EU, along with contributing to the improvement of working and living conditions of all generations and addressing demographic challenges through the life cycle approach. Successful and fair economic and social recovery must be based on a responsive, resilient and inclusive labour market. More than ever, it's important that we pursue quality work for better life quality for, for all generations. Slovenia will give the quality of employment a priority during its incoming presidency. Quality being reflected in the following aspects ensuring safety and health at work, strengthening the relevant skills of workers, creating the conditions for reconciling professional and private life, as well as ensuring adequate pay for work. Our efforts must include those groups of the population which are hardest deployed, namely the young, low-skilled and older workers. Addressing the young unemployed is key, but we must also pay special attention to providing uh, appropriate working conditions and lifelong training for older workers. Ladies and gentlemen, we must do everything to maintain a fair and inclusive labor market and society that offer equal opportunities to all. We must ensure that green and digital transitions, transitions do not create even greater gaps in quality and that no one is left behind. 
Together we are stronger and with joint forces we are also more resilient to the future challenges. Thank you and I wish you fruitful discussions today. Minister Kreidi, thank you very much indeed for sparing time as you prepare for the Slovenian presidency of the European Union. But under underscoring there the danger of even greater gaps and the inability to actually uh, build over those gaps, a fear of the deepening of rifts in society. So, President Sakesian, welcome. And um, I'd like to talk to you first of all, because we're hoping to be joined as well by Ilga Slupinska, who until last week was the Minister of Education and Science in Latvia, but then she resigned. And we want to hear about the reality of politics. But I'd like to come to you because of what you've been enduring in Armenia uh, for the last, um, well, particularly since November. And what you talked about in an article which you wrote back in January, you described... Um, the existence of a deep political, economic, social, and psychological crisis. You talked about what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh, which uh, you know as a suck, um, the enclave there. You uh, you referred to it as a defeat, a defeat of that system, not of the soldiers, the people, and the nation. What I'm trying to come to is asking you about the reason why we're talking, which is fostering shared humanity. You've been through the shock last November, where really you were unable to share humanity with your neighboring country of Azerbaijan and with other involved parties, Turkey and Russia. What have you learned from that um, experience about whether shared humanity is possible? It's a very, I think it's a very important but very difficult uh, question. I think shared humanity is a necessity. Can you do that or not? It's a different question. I think for the moment we were waiting to, to, to get a sign from the neighboring Azerbaijan. Uh, after the war is, is in ceasefire, there are hundreds of uh, prisoners of war still in Azerbaijan in Baku. The Armenian side has returned to Azerbaijan the prisoners of war and Azerbaijan has not do done that. And of course, after the ceasefire, people have to look for the, in, in order to look to the future, you have to think about more stability and building up and trust with the neighbors. And you cannot build trust when hundreds of families in Armenia are, are waiting for their sons to return back. And Azerbaijani soldiers on the borders between Armenia and, 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 Azer, and Azerbaijan are crossing the borders, creating tensions and so on and so forth. So shared humanity is important, but as you said in the beginning uh, of, of uh, as, as an introduction, Nick, this is a new world that uh, I would describe it like that, that uh, uncertainty is new certainty. Unpredictability is the new predictability. And we have to learn to, to live in this new world. Because this world is uh, is dramatically different from the one that we lived before. It's dramatically different because we are going through sort of a rapid revolution of technology that is having huge impact on the way we behave socially and politically, the way we uh, exercise our rights of democracy and election. All of that has changed. Politicians have to report to their those who have elected them daily through Facebook and other uh, other, other means. So the world has changed and we have to recognize that the world has changed and we are feeling uncertain un that we're living in unsafe, unpredictable world because we don't understand this world, Nick. Because we are still in our minds thinking about this world and I would say classically. As a former physicist, I would compare this with, for example, what was happening more than 100 years ago in physics. All physicists worldwide were in panic because they couldn't understand what is happening. He was the great classical physics father by Isaac Newton has, has been gone then and there were events happening that they couldn't understand and explain. So this was a panic of uncertainty and unpredictability predictability, until geniuses like Albert Einstein, Paul Dirac, 
Heisenberg and others created the, the new physics, which was the physics of the big, which is the relativity, and the physics of small, which is the quantum physics. Do you so see that possibility emerging, Mr. President, at all? I mean, you, you were about to publish a book which was seismic in its analysis, as you say, as a physicist, as you say, with a distinguished career before you became president, but talking about the impact of quantum physics, the impact of massive change which is coming, nothing to do with what you were, you have been through in recent months in your country and with neighbouring countries. And I'm wondering how, how much even you have been shocked by the fact that you're focused on something expansive and something amazingly um, uh, positive coming down the track, like quantum. Yeah. Is that could be sidelined by these very difficult problems of dealing yeah. with neighbors and dealing with existing conflicts? Yeah. Well, I, I, I will try to answer that question. First of all, about the book. The book was delayed and uh, publishing of book because of COVID first. And then, uh, then after that, when in September the war started, I mean, the president going around the world and basically advertising his book while his nation is suffering a war didn't make any sense. So I hope soon when things will stabilize and we'll have new elections in Armenia, parliamentary elections, I will have the time of going back to my book. But Armenia is not living on a different planet. We are a part of this world. So we are sharing even our troubles are a part partially because we didn't realize the last 26 years. You know, in 1994, there was a war between on uh, in Artsakh between Armenian side and uh, Azerbaijan. And that war was won by, by Armenians. Do you know why? Because Armenians were ahead of Azeri side for a couple of years in organizing the, the army, technologies, and so on. In this war, Armenian side was behind Azerbaijan 10 years ago. So the war was lost, not by the soldier, not by the nation, by drones, by electronics, by, by technology. So I think we are a part in our uh, our uh, victories and defeats are a part, uh, are partially related also to what has happened. Second, Azerbaijan and Armenia are two different countries. In Azerbaijan, you have a very strong presidential rule. I mean, very strong. I'm being diplomatic. Okay. And in Armenia, we were trying to, to build a democratic state and we mismanaged it. But instead of having parliamentary republic, we created something which is super prime ministerial rule, when the prime minister has all of the rights, but no responsibility. Okay. Third, because of what we were trying to, to develop in Armenia, uh, new technology, which is the Facebook, Twitter, center, had massive impact on the brains of people. So, which is fine. You have communications, you exchange ideas when it is right. But when there is no truth, one is fake. And then this society was, was heavily impacted by fake news and fake, fake uh, information as well. So when you look even at this tragic event, which is the war, the loss of lives, there is an impact of the changed world. In this case, the Armenian side has mismanaged it. As usually happens, if you have a vision if you have a mission, if you understand what's going to happen in the future, then you get huge advantage. Well, you start industrial revolution in UK, then not UK then, then it becomes a British empire worldwide because of the industrial power. Okay. The, the moment we as humans will understand why on earth we are damaging the, the nature when we can be much more powerful or successful without doing that. The moment we will understand why uh, extreme populism using new technology becomes not a positive thing, but a negative thing. The moment we understand that COVID is not the reason of the change or the trouble, it's a consequence of changed world because people travel so far. There are so many people in one place and the mutation of the virus goes much more faster and so on and so forth. So first we have to understand what is happening in this world. Then we can manage it and then we can be optimistic. But can you be optimistic after what you went through last fall between September and November when you saw the involvement particularly of a big neighboring, two big neighboring states? Because we need to look 
we want to think beyond Nagorno-Karabakh or Atsak. We need to think beyond intention, uh, to, to intentions, to repurpose our world and seize the moment of change. I would put to you from our work of thinking the unthinkable that actually it's very difficult to see how it's possible to seize a moment for change, even with the acute emergency, the climate emergency, which is now in gripping us in ways which most people are not really prepared to understand and appreciate. Not for 30 years time, but maybe in three or four years time, things have got to change. The world has got to change. We have to change the world, the way we run our, our, our lives. And therefore that is positive in many ways, but are we prepared to seize that moment for change yeah. or is there reluctance? Yeah. Well, I, I thank you for basically confirming, confirming also the same thing that I was saying. That first we have to really thoroughly understand that this world has changed dramatically and we're living in a different world. The moment that we change, they understand that we have to think how to live in this world, we have to change our behavior. And then we can be a bit more optimistic that we will live successfully in the changed world. Now, if you take Armenia as a small example, I, I'm not going to speak about climate change or to change the damage of the, to the nature. It's not only climate change. We make huge damage to the nature, not to the only climate, but to the nature as well. And biodiversity. So it's, it's, it's a huge uh, subject, so we will not have the time for it. But if you take the small Armenia, you are right, this is a tragic moment. The nation has lost the war. But the losing the war in Artsakh started the moment 26 years ago the Armenian side won the war and didn't come to with the right conclusion. Behaved unresponsibly, unresponsible way. Basically wasting the time instead of preparing itself to the next war or the defense and all of that stuff. The same is happening with humanity as well. The moment you don't take it responsibility, your victory will become a defeat. About optimism, you know, I'm Armenian, and any Armenian doesn't have any other choice rather than to be an optimist. By definition, this is a nation that has gone through genocide in 1915 with the same neighbor, Turkey. Hundred, more than 100 years ago, one and a half million have been perished, but the people were... I mean, it's not only about optimism, it is the skill of survival. I mean, the, the, the need to survive. And that is why we have restarted, we have now our independent states. We made a mistake, we had a dramatic defeat, we lost thousands of lives there. But there is no choice for any Armenian, even more for the president of Armenians, not to be optimistic. Because I have to push with my word, because I'm not an executive president, by my word, by example, that there is a light at the end of this dark tunnel, and that light is that you have to have clear understanding, clear mission. I mean, you have to identify who you are. You have to have a clear mission, what you have to do, a strategy, then work hard, be disciplined, then the optimist will come. You will build up again strong Armenia that can be strong enough to have relations with all of its neighbors. Repurposing, oh, because world, of I'm picking up on the Frank Richards language here, repurposing our world. You've been through an amazing and deeply terrifying upheaval because of the war. How much has that distracted your small country from the business of addressing what is essentially not just climate change, we are facing an emergency where everyone, including yourself, has to decide how you heat your residence, how, you, how much you drive your car, whether you fly, how you move around the country, etc., etc. When you are also going through the business of surviving a war and building back afterwards, how do you change a population to think in a different way, realizing that the existential threat is less about what's happening uh, across the border and in Atsak and Nagorno-Karabakh. It's actually a survival, an existential issue here. So, Mr. President, uh, what I'm trying to do is get you to think. Uh, you th you've always been a big thinker, as you mentioned with Newton and so on. Help me understand how you think that is possible to create a repurposing and seizing the moment. Because as John Kerry and Alok Sharma, the head of the COP26 negotiations for the United Kingdom, as Fatih Barol from the International Energy Agency are all saying, 
we're nowhere near what is needed to make sure we can stabilize the the climate at no more than 1.5 degrees. And now you can see I'm wearing a badge here, which sort of confirms that I'm pretty engaged on this. But for someone like you who's a political leader, how do you change? Because that's going to be the expectation in Glasgow, assuming it takes place in November of yeah. COP26. Well, I agree with you. I think changing changing is, is going to be very, very difficult. And if you wait until the tragedy happens, as you mentioned, the tragedy with Artsakh, this war and all of that stuff, what you get after that is a deep depression of people. Can you imagine what can happen to this planet if we will see the real scale and the size of climate change, climate change? And this is going to come if we will not change our behavior. It's going to be so dramatic that for years we will be depressed, every, everybody. Do you think people realize that, Mr. President? Sorry? Do you think people realize that? No, they don't. No. And that this is, this is what uh, exactly I'm trying to say. Because I do see that on a much smaller scale in Armenia after the war. When the, the nation that had brilliant uh, dreams and ideas were doing this, we're trying to bring our... Uh, our, our small contribution to the climate change. I even, even made a presentation at Davos about how can national debt be converted into climate, uh, positive climate contribution. But when you have this, uh, a, a tragedy of this scale, the first thing happens, people get depressed. And it's going to be very, very difficult to raise these people again to start becoming logical with common sense and believe into the future. So I hate to know the date when the big climate tragedy will happen to this world. And instead of reacting or acting, we will get another one, two, three, ten years of depression. Because people, look at what happened with COVID. At the end of the day, is a simple virus. How it has changed the world. Yeah, it has changed the world because we were careless. It has they changed the world, not because COVID is a special virus, because the world has changed. We travel so much, we're all gathered in one place. Instead of enjoying the beauty of the nature, we go all to the shopping malls. We have discovered now that you don't need the shopping mall. I have discovered it myself. When I had my own COVID, I discovered that nobody needs to go to shopping. You can just get whatever you take, let's say, from Marks and Spencer in two hours and better quality and cheaper and supplied very quickly. That's an example. So but I think it the has world a carbon, it has a carbon footprint, of course. Yes, of course. But what, no, this is an example saying that the world has realized that there, we have to realize that the world has changed and we have to start dramatically changing. And there's only one way for that. And that's the, the only tool that I, as a president, have. I've learned that. Just being a president of non executive president in the non parliamentary republic is not easy. And that tool is your word. And that's why I thank you, Nick, and your colleagues and everybody that talks today. And that we have to talk more and more dramatically, more powerfully, because we don't have any other way of convincing people whatever is coming is going to be as dramatic as we are facing after the war in, in Armenia. But that will be global scale. So the word has to come, and I'm ready to join you and other colleagues to speak about the tragedy that the humanity on the planet will face. And all of that other tragedy, the tragedies will, will, will become small, very small, compared with the huge one. Help me understand how you think, as a political leader, you and your government, and also others you're dealing with, I think you were in Kazakhstan a few days ago, um, how they must communicate this. Because there are psychologists who say very clearly that actually if you frighten people too much, they ignore you even more. In other words, how can you turn this into something positive where people realize that actually there is something that they can do, even if it's going to cost them money, which, which is a contribution to society? Because coming down the track, Mr. President, is the likelihood of societal disintegration, potentially, which politicians are going to have to manage. How can they do that? What are your words of wisdom here to encourage people to think politicians particularly to lead in a different way and we're about to see the g7 meeting in in the united kingdom literally in four days time in cornwall in the southwest of england 
Yeah, well, I, I'm not so pessimistic as some of some of the colleagues will sound. I agree with you. We should not frighten them for several reasons. I think the tool that we have to use energetically is common sense and logic. This is 21st century, and science technology matters. And there is more and more people that believe in science and technology, and they believe in in reasoning. So whenever we have to speak, we have to speak with facts and the data and information and prove it. That's one. Secondly, I'm optimistic because there is a new generation that is coming up. And that generation is different than the, the one before. I look at my children, my sons. They are both, I didn't spend probably specific time of making them green, but they are both green. Their children even are more greener. So they think about, because you look my sons, even on the simple, uh, simple issues when we, they were, they were speaking about, I mean, having a steak in a restaurant. When you think that the, the, the poor animal was slaughtered, but then the other side is, as everybody knows that the number, number of beef worldwide makes a contribution to the climate change. And the solution there, maybe, I'm not sure, is either the genetic or, or, or artificial growth, or maybe the solution is having a beef which is made of uh, vegetables or other plants that tastes like, like a beef, but is not made from the meat of the beef <laughs> of, or the cow. So I think I'm optimistic because whatever we have done has already impacted me. But maybe we don't realize that, but there's a generation of young people growing realizing more and more that taking care of the planet and the nature and the climate matters. That's why I am optimistic. And I see that in Armenia. My both children live, one of them lives worldwide because he is running several businesses. The other one lives in UK. And my, my, my niece lives in Armenia and I live in Armenia. I see even in Armenia, there's a lot of this green movement towards the nature, towards Towards also inheritance, whatever you have inherited culturally, historically, I think there is a new generation that will take care of better. And this is where, where our generation and we, and I'm ready to do that, have to speak to them more and I share with them the experience. I do you feel under, you, do you feel under pressure? Do you feel under pressure from your? Do you feel under pressure from your family in your next generation? Um, I, I've heard about a report which is coming out for for September for the United Nations, where many chief executives are are uh, revealing that actually they feel now under pressure from their family, from their kids, from their daughters, from their from their sons, from their grandchildren, rather than the shareholders. In fact, we reported this in our work at Thinking the Unthinkable. Ben von Burton from Shell saying he feels under pressure from his daughter, who who says who tells him uh, that she believes Greenpeace more than she believes him. Now that's an extreme, probably, but it's indicative of a way of thinking and a way of pressure which is building. Are you feeling that? Well, uh, I've long I've lived a long diplomatic and political and business life, so to put pressure on me. It's, it's, I don't, I don't. Encouragement. Let's call it encouragement. I don't want to do that. But the best, best pressure on me, I would uh, tell to you is when my granddaughter, who is eight years old, hugs me and talks about things about nature and what, how, how he likes the animals there, that we have to be very careful and so on. That's not a pressure. That's the pressure of love. And I think that pressure of love be that from our children or grandchildren, or from our love to nature, I think that's the the, way, the path forward. Is I that think, how we repurpose our world then, through through that kind of uh, loving pressure from within a family? I think loving pressure not only through the family. I think somehow uh, I feel being a president of the republic and head of the state, but no executive powers for the moment. I hope that we will change the constitution, but then. Most important thing that I want to deliver to to my uh, to my fellow Armenians is that we have to really start loving and loving our nation, our children, and that's why we have to go through hard working discipline and understanding strategy and the mission to rebuild the country. And the same way for the future of our children, we have to take care of the nature in Armenia and elsewhere. 
not in Armenia because Armenia is a part of the world. Any one tree planted in Armenia makes a contribution for the climate worldwide. One tree in Armenia makes a contribution. So we have to do that for Armenia and for the whole world. And doing now, that... Uh, we're, getting, we're getting some questions now. We've got 15 minutes to run, Mr. President. Christine Kurtzi, um, are you available? Would you like to speak at the moment? Um, and while you line yourself up, let me just tell you that David Goldsmith has uh, contributed, has not society moved towards individualism as compared to community? in tier four countries and therefore making changes necessary. Example, a single post on Facebook is equivalent to three 20 watt light bulbs running for one hour. Christine, come in. Am I on there? You are, we can see you. And Mr. Yeah. President, you as well. And thank you so much for this absolutely fantastic and inspiring conversation. And Mr. President, um, I was where, where really curious you, after you. Where, where are you? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I'm in the Netherlands. I'm in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, uh, one of the best places in the world, I would say. And, um, and if you could be brief, please, because we have a lot coming in. Yeah. No, I just want to add on uh, what Mr. President said um, on love. I just wanted to give you the words, Mr. President, that we often use in our work nowadays that we need to lead from love. I would take it one notch up, and I would like to suggest that let love lead. That's it. Let love lead, Mr. President. I mean, you introduced this five minutes ago, um, mentioning, I think, your granddaughter. So build on that a little bit as I wait for more questions to come in. Thank you, Christine. Shall we continue, or are there are questions? Please. No, no, keep going. Um, Christine has picked up your theme of love. Now, that's not something that politicians and presidents normally talk about too publicly as a part of po politics and make getting things done. Well, I, I have to because that's an ingredient without which we cannot rebuild the country in Armenia. We cannot uh, rebuild ourselves and have hopes that we'll get again a strong country and also help people in, in, in Artsakh. But also one has to realize that Armenia is, is a unique, is a unique nation in the sense that it has small state, but it's a global nation. There are four or five times more Armenians living abroad than in, in Armenia. But I agree with the notion, the, the, the words that you said, some of the colleagues had, uh, one of the colleagues has said that the world is becoming more individualistic or individual. I mean, well, uh, I have to refer to, to the book, uh, to my book. That's called the, the new quantum world. The quantum in this case means that this world is different from the classical world that we lived 30 years or 50 years ago. But quantum also means that the power of individual has grown. So individuals have more power today than they had before. And the design of this world, the design of the way we run politics, business, uh, defense, and many things, depends on the power of individual. When I mean, look at how many in individuals have become multi-billionaires by building an empire from nothing. Look how, how important is the contribution of individual in running the uh, uh, fighting the coronavirus. Even the democracy has become quantum in a sense that Basically, every individual has this not only right, but also the means to express themselves. Go back 50 years ago, people were sitting at home or giving their views only in a pub or, 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 or a cafe or going to the party political meeting. But now they can express that every day. And summary of this individual quantum ideas creates something that has huge impact on politicians. Politicians today are more affected by their public appearance, the, the level of uh, approval that they get, but that the level of approval is not before and after elections, it's daily. And that daily approval comes from quantum, comes, comes from individual. Yes, the world has become more in the individual. The power of individuals has grown up, and this is directly connected with the new technology and the new world that we are living, but we have still to learn how to live and to how to harvest the positive from this new world and individual or quantum world. 
Let me pick up with a couple of comments already from Yu Fang Guo, founder and chairman of Yomek Investment. How difficult is it for a country or a nation to love its neighbors? I know what he's referring to there. Very difficult, probably, particularly if you've had wars, right? And there's another one from, I think it's Achan, but I, it's spelt in a rather strange way. When you talk about love, you talk of, uh, of, to, uh, to your own people, not necessarily overseas governments or overseas peoples. The key thing is your own people must believe their own government, whether it's love or otherwise. The pandemic has opened people's eyes to the in inadequacy of many government systems. And Mr. President, you, are, you live in a, a very complex region. And uh, I'm, I'm noting that Germany, for example, is talking now about significant clandestine interference by Russia in its security version going on there. We're seeing the same thing happening from the People's Republic of China, very aggressive diplomacy now. How does that contrast or it does contrast significantly with what you're talking about, the need for what you call love? Well, I think there should, I think our friends and colleagues should realize there's a difference. Maybe there's something in common, but there's also a difference between me and John Lennon. <laughs> Or Beatles, when they were uh, singing, all you need is love. The love has different appearances. When I was speaking about love as well, first of all, I speak about love uh, of the individual towards his own family, his relatives, his country, his the, the place he leaves, the nature, and so on and so forth. But love can have different appearances as well. Love is also when uh, when you love being a human and you live with human consciousness, uh, and also carrying with you a level of morality. And that helps you to deal with, with, uh, with, uh, with your neighbors as well. Hatred doesn't take you. Hatred just adds one on, a, on, on another. To come to love doesn't mean that if you had a tragic history, even some as tragic as Armenians had with, with Turkey, you can jump on tomorrow to normalize the relations. But it's, it is a, a path that you have to start going today. And it starts, as I told you, with simple gestures. If today Azerbaijan will send back 200 or more prisoners of war to Armenia, I can assure you a lot of people in Armenia will somehow, with difficulty, but will appreciate that. And can you can you have love with Turkey at the moment? You use the word hatred. No, no, let's, 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 Nick, let's not simplify the word love. Love is 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 much more complex. It's not about. I think this is. Uh, uh, then we will start playing with the words. Understand. Loving, I think you can one day, if Turkey recognizes the genocide, if the relations between Armenia and Turkey will become normal, if they will recognize that what they did during the last war when a member state of NATO was attacking and helping Azerbaijan and directly attacking non-NATO states, small country like Armenia. I think speaking about words like love, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically absolutely impossible here. Mr. President, but, we got, we got but, some but, but there's no way that Armenians and Turks will, will try to live together another 100 or 200 years without realizing that at least we have to have respecting each other's rights. Do you call that respect of each other's rights love? It's up to you. But respect of each other's rights is important. Respect of each other's rights. Okay, well, we'll remember that. That's really very important. Let me ask, we've got five minutes to run, no more. Professor Aditya Singh, director of the uh, Athena Group. Uh, are you there, Aditya, please? Quickly, uh, we have four minutes to run. Pick up the microphone if you can, please. Are you there? I'm very much here. Here you are. Literally, um, quickly, if you can. Very quick question. I'm from India. I want to understand from you, what is the power of the diaspora? Of course, Armenia has a lot of diaspora all across the world. What is the kind of influence they play for countries in today's world of humanity and creating relationships? Thank you. Thank you very much, Aditya. Uh, so, Mr. President, does that help you uh, seize the moment for change to repurpose our world? You have a very active Armenian diaspora. 
Yeah, I think that's what I was saying before. Armenia is a small state, but it's a global nation. That helps Armenians to think globally, to many Armenians. Unfortunately, I would say as the president of the republic, I can say that we can do much, much more in engaging diaspora. Unfortunately, the constitution of the republic doesn't allow Armenians from diaspora directly be involved in political life of the country which I consider wrong, and that's why I'm, I'm basically advocating to change the constitution in Armenia, to allow Armenians from abroad to be a part of the decision-making in Armenia. Just a simple example, an Armenian from diaspora. And if you look at, at different countries, you will find Armenian ministers in many countries working, scientists, technology, businessmen, but they cannot, if they are successful people abroad, they cannot become minister in Armenia because they have to come and live four years only in Armenia and have only Armenian passport. Well, they are, the law allows Armenians to have second passport on the third. So that's an obstacle and it's unwise decision. And it's exactly uh, a decision that shows how unwise a human being can be. I mean, we repeat the same mistakes worldwide in different sectors. Armenians knowing that their biggest strength is diaspora by constitution and this is this was decided because the politicians didn't want the interference of diaspora in political life. They wanted the comfort of running the country only themselves. They have deprived the country from the biggest asset they had which is the diaspora. Well, you were speaking about COVID. In the United States, there are two vaccines. One is Pfizer's, the other one is Moderna. The Moderna, five, uh, the Moderna was created by a, a company or, or a venture fund, which is called Flagship Ventures. And the head of that company is a professor of um, MIT, Nubar Afeya. Fantastic young man, very patriotic, great uh, scientist and a technologist. So that gentleman, Nubar Afeya, that has created one of the two two uh, vaccines in the United States, cannot become Minister of Science in Armenia. Because he has to come and live four years in Armenia and have only Armenian passport. Which is not, we, we, which we, is, we, we literally have a minute left, and I'm just going to pick up your words from January. And if you can answer this in 30 seconds, we must acknowledge the existence of a deep political, economic, social, and psychological crisis. Do you think you'll be saying the same kind of thing in about a year's time? Quickly, if you can, please. Well, I, I was saying this to Armenian nation that has gone through the war and the loss of thousands of young people under the attack of Azerbaijan and Turkey. I will regret if we'll, I will say that in a year or two or three to the world, that the world is going through deep crisis because we were not wise enough three or five or ten years ago to take the right decision to protect the nature and change ourselves to live in harmony with nature. I will regret so much if in five or 10 years time, I will have to say to the humanity, not to fellow Armenians. So I'm saying that we made mistakes. We could have avoided this war by making Armenia stronger and wiser and smarter. So to the world is, we still have the chance of making this world safer place. And I will regret again. If I will be to say in five years' time that we are going through big crisis. Because if we don't change it now, we'll be going through big crisis worldwide in nature, related with nature, in five years' time. Mr. President, thank you very much indeed. And if I can add a personal comment here, that's what our project on Thinking the Unthinkable is about. Much of what is happening is not unthinkable. It's actually unpalatable. And that's got to be embraced and engaged and picking up what you said about five to 10 years ago. Much of what is happening now could have been foreseen, including a pandemic, but politicians and leaders didn't want to believe it was possible. But now they have to think about that. And the climate emergency is, um, is now moving towards us at high speed. Final thought, Bill Gates says there's a vaccine for COVID, but there's no vaccine for the climate emergency. That's a sobering thought. So, Mr. President, thank you. Yeah, well, I hope we'll get a vaccine for human.